Thank you so much, Susan. And yes, it's true that uh, I'm guilty as charged in May. Completed my doctorate in uh, clinical bioethics at the Loyola University of Chicago uh, Strick School of Medicine. It's really a very exciting journey. Thank you. So thank you so much to everyone who has chosen to join us today. I'm really excited to be able to present this information. And I always like to go ahead and do a little financial disclosure at the beginning, just to let people know that um, I actually do work uh, for myself in my practices, uh, the Downing Center for Animal Pain Management and the Windsor Veterinary Clinic here in Windsor, Colorado, um, as a practice owner and hospital director but I do enjoy sponsorship by several companies. And of course, I want to thank Somatica this morning for um, participating and allowing me to bring this information to you all. I can't really ever give any kind of a pain management lecture without paying homage to my most important pain management mentor. And now it's Dr. Peter Hellier, who's a uh, president, he was the founding president of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. Um, he is a professor of anesthesia and analgesia here at Colorado State University, and of course, the diplomate of that college as well. So I'd like to open by letting people know that I do what you do for a living. So this is a picture of the front of my hospital in a little town in northern Colorado. And one of the reasons I like to share the, this information is I think it's really important to understand that first, I do what you do for a living, which is practice medicine and solve pets problems and make pet lives better, which ultimately makes life better for the pet parents. Um, but I think it's also important for me to share that I practice in a small town. Literally, it's like Mayberry RFD. Uh, my address is on Main Street in downtown Old Town, Windsor. There were 5,000 people when I moved here in 1991, and there are now about 20,000 people, but still very, very small town feel. The reason that's an important piece of data is that all of the things I'm going to talk about this morning are all things that we engage in in my practice, and if Things like this will fly in a small town. They'll pretty much fly anywhere that you might find yourself practicing. So in our primary care practice, the Windsor Veterinary Clinic, we're all about this. We're all about celebrating, protecting, and sharing the special love of animals. And this is posted on the front of our hospital. So our people who enter know that this is what we're all about. And in the Downing Center, our practice motto is that they, our patients, don't deserve to hurt. And I think that's a really important detail for us to focus on. So as a, an undergraduate, I was an English major and I collect quotes from old dead guys. And so this is our first old dead guy quote of the day. Divinum est opus sedare delorum. This is a quote by Galen, who was acknowledged to be really uh, almost a more important first physician than even Hippocrates. And this translates directly from the Latin that divine is the work to subdue pain. I think that's really important for us to remind ourselves periodically that what we do is critically important work on behalf of our patients. Another old dead guy, Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham was a philosopher in the time of Rene Descartes. And some of you may remember Cartesian coordinates, X axis, Y axis, Z axis. Well, Descartes was also a philosopher and he's very famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. And one of his premises was, if you can't speak, then you can't think. And if you can't think, you can't experience pain. Ergo, if you can't speak, you can't experience pain. And of course, we know that leaves out a whole swaths of beings, including our patients, nonverbal or preverbal children, nonverbal adults. In other words, people who clearly, beings who clearly can experience pain. And Bentham was really the guy who said, it's really not about can they reason or can they talk, but rather, can they suffer? And of course, we know the answer to that is a resounding yes. So I also like to share these data points. This is really a study that was done a number of years ago asking anonymous people in an anonymous survey back in the days when people actually answered their phones and spoke to strangers, asking this question, 
yes or no, my pet is a member of the family. And even at that time, three quarters of these people were willing to say, yes, my pet really is a, ma a member of my family. Next question, my pet is one of the most important things in my life, yes or no. And as you can see, two thirds, yes. Number three is my personal favorite, that my pet is a better companion than the other humans in my hospital. And you know, for every one of the 50% who said yes to this, there were some people in the closet. So what does that really mean for us? It means that we serve a very precious relationship. And this is an example of that precious relationship. This is my mother and sitting on her lap is Andre. And I, I like to tell the story that when I was growing up, my parents were nice to me and my sister. We always had food on the table and shoes on our feet and clothes on our back. And then I met Andre and I found out what my life might have been like because Andre wanted for nothing. And when my mother was diagnosed with stage three B ovarian cancer and given six weeks to live, it was Andre who gave my mother a reason to wake up in the morning. And it was Andre who provided my mother a focus beyond the next blood test or the next chemotherapy. And when my mother died almost seven years after her diagnosis, it was Andre who was on her bed in the hospital-based hospice to provide her with companionship as she herself crossed the Rainbow Bridge. This is such a precious relationship that we all have the privilege of serving. And I think it's important for us not to forget that it also means we will always have job security. We are the only medical profession on the planet that serves its patients from womb to tomb, from cradle to grave. And while there are medical professionals who serve all life stages, family practitioners, for instance, not one doctor is gonna be alive long enough to serve you from the beginning to the end of your life. This is such a unique position for us to be in because we see it all. Another old dead guy is one of my favorite, a French physician who stated that medicine should be practiced as a form of friendship. And friendship relies on relationship. And basically, friends don't let friends hurt. So I think it's important when we start talking about what's the current state of affairs in pain management, that we remind ourselves, it wasn't all that long ago, that we thought pain was a pretty simple process. So we put our foot B in the fire A, and then there's this train track C that takes the pain signal up to our pain center in our brain. and Oh, I rue the day that we found out it wasn't quite that simple. So I look to, as we all do, to the International Association for the Study of Pain for the definitive diagnosis or the definitive definition of what, what is pain. And for decades and decades, this was it, an unpleasant and emotional experience associated with either actual or potential tissue damage. And for so many generations, this was considered adequate. And it was really only very recently in the history of medicine that this second part was added, which states that the inability to communicate really does not negate the possibility that an individual, any individual is experiencing pain and is in need of appropriate pain care. So we think about pain in both people and pets. We recognize that it's a pretty complex and multifaceted experience that includes several key components. There's the sensory and informational component. This is the physiology of pain. And this is really the benchmark or the cornerstone of building an appropriate pain management strategy. But we cannot forget the emotional dimension, which is the suffering aspect of pain. And then finally, the cognitive or evaluative component. And this is really the, 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 the attention to pain. This is the understanding of a previous experience of pain. And this is where we think about the perceived threat that the individual experiences in the face of pain. So why is pain important? And you all may think this is very self-evident, but I think it's really important to remember that even Albert Schweitzer, a 
humanitarian and physicians said that pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. My parents had a very close friend who chose to complete suicide because his pain from his trigeminal neuralgia could not be managed. And it's the Buddhists who say that while pain is inevitable, it's the suffering that is optional. And that's really where we come in to prevent suffering. So long as we remember and understand that pain is very complex and very scientifically intriguing, we do not have all the answers yet. It's very clinically challenging, particularly for us who deal with nonverbal species. And it's easy to overlook. We've all had that dog or that cat in our practice who just chooses not to tell us that anything is wrong. However, it is so worth making changes in our way of practice, in our way of handling our patients to improve their care, because this is what we want, happy, happy patients. So one of the things I think is really critical for us to understand is that we can actually make an impact on chronic pain by paying attention to acute pain. And one of, the, one of the studies that was published in the human pain arena that really shifted my personal paradigm and professional paradigm was this one, looking at the importance of perioperative analgesia. And this is all about stopping chronic pain before it happens. So total knee, arthro uh, total knee arthroplasty, TKA, is acknowledged to be the most painful orthopedic procedure that people undergo electively. And I will tell you that having had both my knees replaced and a hip replacement and a spinal fusion with a decompression, my knee replacements were clearly the most painful of those four procedures that I undertook. So in this study, everybody got standard of care. And then cohort A got a continuous femoral nerve block for two days. Cohort B got some additional opioid therapy. And here's what they found in the first couple of days. And this is not really out of the realm of imagination, but the cohort that got the femoral nerve block actually did better in the first two days. But here's what's really interesting. 40 days later, those individuals who had the continuous femoral nerve block had improved range of motion and they had an earlier discharge from their rehab 40 days later. Now, look at the date, 1999. This is not a new study, but a foundational study. And some of you are probably thinking, hmm, two days of post-op analgesia sounds familiar. And it should sound familiar because this is the kind of study that actually led to the development of what we call nosita, And on the human side, it's called Xperel. So there are consequences if we don't pay attention to pain. So there is good pain. Good pain helps us survive. But if we don't pay attention to it, when it's just a minor nuisance, it can actually lead to not just um, a decrease in quality of life, but it can become unbearable. And without relief, pain kills. It suppresses the immune system. We get increased levels of cortisol. Um, we get altered changes in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord that facilitate ongoing pain unrelated to organic disease. And this is where my education in the 80s was really lacking because in the early 80s, when I was in veterinary school, we just learned that the spinal cord carried the signals and that was kind of all we learned. And it really is quite recent information in the big scheme of medical things that we understand that the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is critically important. And I want you to put a pin in that because I'm going to circle back to that dorsal horn in a bit. This is why people, this is why pets bite people. All right. So I said that there's good pain and there's bad pain. And it was Clifford Wool who is a, a neuroscientist and a physician who really gave us this newer vocabulary about pain, that we have good pain and bad pain. We have adaptive pain and maladaptive pain. And in adaptive pain, that's the, that's the response our body has if we put our hand on the hot stove and our nervous system causes us to reflexly pull our hand back before we burn the skin off the palm of our hands. That's no sense of pain. 
in response to a transient noxious stimulus. Inflammatory pain, on the other hand, can be temporary. We sprain our ankle and our, our ankle says, please don't walk on the earth, it'll get bad. But if we don't respond appropriately to inflammatory pain, it becomes the gateway to maladaptive pain. And maladaptive pain, Wolf actually has two big categories, neuropathic pain, which is spontaneous pain or hypersensitivity in association with actual damage to the nervous system um, or some other lesion in the nervous system. And then functional pain, which we're gonna have a hard time with because this is really about alterations in central processing. Now there is work being done putting dogs in a functional MRI while they're awake to actually stimulate them in various ways and see where things light up in the brain. But it's a while before we'll understand about central processing. So keep your eye on the neuropathic pain ball because what we're really talking about is sensitization, sensitization of all the tissues at the periphery, at those afferent uh, nerves that bring signals to the spinal cord in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and in the central processing parts of the brain. One of the most important parts of maladaptive pain is understanding that we have neurons in the nervous system that are down regulatory that actually inhibit the input from noxious, of noxious signals from the periphery. And one of the things that happens in maladaptive pain is that those down regulatory inhibitory neurons become non-functional. That is one of the ways that maladaptive pain is facilitated. So wind up, as we call it, is maladaptive pain. And this is my reminder that cats are not small dogs. And as we all know, many of the meds that we now have that we've used for years in dogs, we can't use in cats. We just have to be very careful about our choices because again, this is what we want, happy patients. So what are the nuts and bolts of making a pain plan? Some of this is going to sound maybe intuitive or self-evident. All I really wanna do is bring some of these ideas to front of mind so we don't overlook or forget things that are really basic. So we need to begin at the beginning. And that means really a thorough exam, complete with a metabolic profile. Don't forget a metabolic profile. We have to know what's going on inside our patients beyond their pain. And we need to complete an appropriate diagnostic plan. And that means not missing an osteosarcoma and treating it as an osteoarthritis. Um, I actually have had three different dog patients either referred to me by a colleague or self-referred by a client that turned out to be osteosarcoma that had been treated for a very long time as OA. Don't be that doctor. We want to treat the treatable, and that means treating all the treatable. Many of these patients have comorbidities. Many of the dogs that we deal with have uh, a non-functional or minimally functional thyroid gland. They may have renal disease. They may have other diseases like Addison's or Cushing's. Make sure we treat everything that deserves to be treated. And we need to make a plan and work the plan. And our plan needs to be written both for our benefit our colleagues' benefit, but also for our clients' benefit. So here's what we now know. And again, forgive me, I'm confident that anyone who is here today knows that we have to manage chronic maladaptive pain with a multimodal pain plan because it's just no longer appropriate to throw a non-steroidal at a patient and call it good. Multimodal management means multitasking. So it does mean keeping multiple balls in the air as we juggle care for this patient. But here's an absolutely critical component. And this, I think it's, it's sometimes easy for medical professionals because we talk in this language all the time and we talk to our colleagues and we know the processes in our brain of how we make a plan. I think we sometimes forget that we must actually bring the client into this sphere of care because they are in fact our ticket in to the patient. So as we all know, many, and I would just say most of our chronic pain patients are less active and they're often overweight. They don't move as much. 
so they don't burn as many calories and so it's easier for them to gain weight. If they have a comorbidity of hypothyroidism in the case of dogs, their whole physique is wrong as a lot and their me metabolic function is completely wacko. So the most important PT thing we can do for these chronic pain patients is actually normalizing their body condition and their body composition. And I will refer everyone to the um, AAHA uh, nutritional guidelines for dogs and cats. It's really excellent, excellent guidelines, guidance, and a nice toolkit uh, associated with those guidelines to help us understand that what we're talking about is normalizing body composition. And I never talk to clients about weight loss or deprivation. It's all about normalizing that patient's body composition. Make sure, as I mentioned before, that we manage uh, clinical hypothyroidism. And we need to use a nutrient profile that's actually been proven to facilitate this normalization, which means upregulating the lean genes in the body, downregulating the fat genes in the body, and utilizing a nutrient profile that actually allows the body to burn its fat compartment as its preferred energy source. And we have good nutrigenomic data to help us do that. So then concomitantly, we need to break the pain cycle. And we start with pharma. And we start with NSAIDs because they really are a cornerstone of pain management because they decrease inflammation and they do reduce pain. And they actually have specific receptors in the central nervous system at which they can have an effect. No matter what you've been told with marketing materials, the best NSAID is the NSAID that works best in your patient. Failure or a sensitivity to one NSAID does not necessarily mean no NSAIDs can be used. I will tell you in my pain practice, if a patient develops sensitivity to two NSAIDs, two different classes, so say ibuprofen and melocaine, I do not it's like two strikes, they're out. I do not go to a third and say, I rely on other things. And then once pain is controlled and only when pain is controlled from a multimodal perspective, can we titrate the NSAID to the lowest effective dose, which in my practice is often zero. I reserve the NSAID for acute exacerbations of pain, or if I have to do a procedure like remove a tumor or do an oral surgery and remove a tooth. Next step, we understand that chronic Pain is maladaptive or maladaptive pain. It's pain as disease. And maladaptive pain absolutely demands we target the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Targeted therapy is still a pretty new process in veterinary medicine. And it's still relatively new in human medicine. But targeted therapy is exactly why you're here, so that you can understand that each of the pieces that I'm talking about in making a pain plan targets a specific part of that pain picture. Think of the patient as the hub of a wheel. And each of these modalities that I'm mentioning are like spokes on that wheel. And everything works together synergistically better than any one piece can work by itself. So my very favorite tool for attacking the dorsal horn is gabapentin because it has an exquisitely specific place it works, the alpha-2 delta subunit of the calcium channel in the dorsal horn. So it affects influx and efflux of calcium in the neurons. And this allows us literally to reset the set point for what becomes a painful stimulus. This is really critically important for chronic maladaptive pain use. Um, Angles being the most uh, commonly used application, peripheral uh, painful diabetic neuropathy, another chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, a third. Here's the key. We have to dose it appropriately, and that means starting at 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram, two to three times a day, and then we escalate that dose at regular intervals to reach the appropriate effect, which is pain relief without sedation. Sedation is really the most important side effect, um, but it, we have to dose it like we do opiates to effect. What is the best dose is the best dose for that particular patient. A myth of gabapentin is you won't see effects for a week. That's wrong. You'll see effects within 24 hours, but peak effects take a little bit longer. 
And so I reassess my patients about every two weeks. And sedation is the only relevant side effect. So then reduce the dose. Don't take it away. And whatever you do, educate your clients that they cannot stop this drug abruptly. If they do, the patient will experience rebound pain. I've seen this only twice. It was very early in my use of gabapentin. It was horrifying because these patients will end up with screaming pain. And long-term dosing is fine. This drug will not adversely affect either the kidneys or the liver. In human medicine, they talk about reducing the dose in end-stage renal patients, and these are kidney patients who are on dialysis waiting for a transplant. We do not see those patients. I will tell you that my long-term chronic renal cats will sometimes require a dose decrease as their kidney function truly fails, but that is really the only time. One other tool for the dorsal horn is this drug, amantadine. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist, complements the non-steroidal and can complement gabapentin as well. And in the article in the journal of the, uh, IC, uh, the ACDIM, uh, which is an open source journal, by the way, so you can access this study, two to five mg per kilo per day was what was uh, described and well tolerated in the patients, in the dogs, in this study. It's really not affordable unless it's compounded and compounding does make it more affordable. What I have found is that I have very rarely reached for this medicine in recent days because I have relied more heavily on gabapentin and I feel like I have actually achieved better outcomes. So what other pharma agents can we use? So I love PSGAGs, polysulfated glycosamine and glycans, also known as adequin, useful in dogs and cats. And I need to disclose right this minute that I am going way off script here because what I'm going to talk about is extra label use. This is so extra label. So it's important to remember that what PSGAGs do is provide building blocks of cartilage so they won't replace cartilage that's already gone. And that's what makes it important for us to use it early in a pain plan. But what it does do is it heals micro fractures in the cartilage that happen as part of OA progression. And this allows us to actually indirectly create anti-inflammation because it heals those micro fractures. The dosing I use is the dose that's on the label and it's two mix per pound, not two mix per kg, two mix per pound under the skin, not in the muscle. The label says in the muscle. Well, I've been using it now for almost 30 years under the skin and I clearly get clinical outcomes that are desirable. I use in both cats and dogs, it's only labeled for dogs. There's not enough money in the universe for any company to go back to the bench and make studies to go to the FDA and change that label. The other thing that I do is I take the patient through the same process that's on the label twice a week for four weeks, once a week for four weeks, and then the label says stop. But we never cure OA in two months. So then we go to maintenance every 10 to 15 days. I've talked with colleagues who will do Atticon once a month as maintenance, and I'm here to tell you that is wrong. It is never, ever, ever an appropriate interval. These patients need a booster dose, if you will, about every 10 to 15 days. How do we know the difference between 10 days and 15? Because the client reports that they start to see changes in movement between day 10 and 15. And if that happens, we move to day 10. I have had two cats in the past. One of them was my own who needed it every week, or I saw a difference. So we teach the clients how to do this. And I will tell you, this makes Adequin one of the most affordable drugs for cats with osteoarthritis. Start using it as soon as you, you identify that the patient will benefit and long-term use is just fine. It gets to the synovial joints, which means even the joints in the spine, those facet joints, within about 72 hours, because this is what we want. We want cats and dogs who are able to engage in their activities of daily living. So now let's turn our attention to non-pharmacologic ways 
for us to address pain from a multimodal perspective. So nutrition is a great tool. Nutraceuticals, great tool. So first on our list should be a therapeutic nutrient profile because we have those that have been proven in clinical studies to make a difference in these patients. The other is knowing that omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA, will make a big difference in our patients. It's very important that we realize we need to use a triglyceride formulation, not an esterized formulation. The triglyceride formulation is bioavailable and the esterized is not. There are, are now several formulations available in veterinary medicine that are clearly uh, indicated to be the triglyceride form. A molecule that's a fairly recent addition is UC2 or on denatured collagen type 2. And this is a very cool molecule because in a rat model of OA, it actually showed slowed deterioration of articular cartilage. And it does this by this very unique mechanism of action. There isn't anything else we deal with that uses this particular pathway. This is an immune modulation via Peyer's patches in the gut. I haven't thought about Peyer's patches since first year veterinary school and the anatomy lab. But what happens is that this molecule stimulates the immune system to recognize type 2 collagen. And that type 2 collagen recognition prompts the immune system to create anti-inflammatory cytokines. Pretty darn cool. And in actual clinical studies, there were really positive humans, dogs, and horses. And I use this molecule in cats as well. Another non-drug strategy is utilizing a milk protein from the milk of hyperimmunized cows that actually inhibits cytokines, and that in turn inhibits neutrophils from migrating to the sites of inflammation. So what this does is it blocks inflammation. It blocks the upregulation of inflammation, and thus it slows the destructive chronic inflammation associated with OA. This and UC2 both Different mechanism than non-steroidals, different mechanism than steroids, so we can use them concomitantly. And one of the things to remember with any nutraceutical is it's not like you get a response in a day. They actually typically 10 to 14 days. So overlapping a non-steroidal or a steroid with these nutraceuticals is absolutely a critical part of the process. So this is part of establishing pain relief. And then, and only then, can we begin titrating down the dose of a non-steroidal or a corticosteroid. And there are very, very few side effects, primarily in the GI tract. I've had only a handful of patients that can tolerate uh, these, these compounds. One of the more, even more recent entries into the nutraceutical market is this, um, based on a bio, it's a biologic based in greenland mussels for perna canaliculus that is actually cultivated like you would cultivate wheat or corn in a very specific environment that allows for a very rich palette of fatty acids as well as bioactive lipids that then in uh the formulation to which I'm referring is actually complemented by a hyaluronic acid molecule of a very specific molecular weight that has been shown in uh, radio labeled studies to actually get into synovial joints. The key with something like pernicanaliculus, this uh, actually bioactive being, is that the end product, the actual formulation, has to be manufactured in a way that doesn't denature it or interfere with its efficacy. And this is true of all nutraceuticals. It's so critical for us as veterinarians to make certain demands of our manufacturing partners to make sure that what we're, we're talking about is a formulation that has been shown in clinical in species to be effective and that it is not about a single or simple ingredient. So the other facet of non-pharmacologic management of pain and making our pain plan is looking at physical therapy 
physical medicine, so physiotherapy and physical medicine modalities. And there is a whole host of things that we can and should be thinking of doing for our patients, some of which really just demand that we have an excellent textbook in our possession that can help us know how to apply these things appropriately. We do not necessarily need to step out of our lives and go do advanced training as I have done, as many of my colleagues have done. There's so many things that we can do in primary care but it does mean that you need to have good textbooks on hand. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the ones that I use religiously is the uh, Millis and Levine textbook, um, K9 Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation in the second edition. Uh, I do need to disclose, disclose that I have a chapter on pain management in that text, but I tell you about that book because it has great protocols at the back. And there have been several editions uh, in the literature um, there is a second textbook now, Barbara Bachstaller from Europe was one of the uh, editors. And um, if I will share my email at the end and I would be happy to send any of you um, a description link to those books. So what mo other modalities, what specific modalities might we think about in primary care uh, in a practice where we want to do more for our patients. One of my favorite technologies is this, and that's targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Um, electromagnetic field therapy is really another sort of unique piece. Um, there are some very specific biophysics involved that involves calcium signaling and decreasing the production of nitrous oxide, which we know is quite a destructive in the body when it comes to chronic maladaptive pain. And it's this combination of affecting calcium and affecting nitrous oxide production that creates this decreased overall inflammatory response. And what's also interesting is in the case of fracture sites. So who do we think of? Well, obviously animals with fractures, but what about induced fractures? Well, we induce a fracture in every TPLO patient, and we can actually increase healing at the site of the TPLO because we know that electromagnetic field therapy in this targeted place, in this targeted delivery, actually increases activity in numbers of osteoblasts. This is just an example of a dog who had a carpal injury, was getting a relief from uh, electromagnetic field therapy. And this modality decreases both acute and chronic inflammation. There are several really cool attributes. It's safe, it's effective, it's non-invasive. But for me, what it really does is it actively engages owners who want very badly to be able to do something. They want to do something to participate in their pet's care. They get it about food. They get it about medicine. But they want to really be able to do something. And this gives us an opportunity for them to actually do something useful on the days in between times that they see us for our issues, for their issues. And what's really interesting about targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy is that the, there now has been evidence to guide us that we can use this for seizure and anxiety management. It's a different frequency of pulsing, um, but it's really a unique way to think about managing things that are already difficult to manage, seizures and anxiety, very difficult to manage already. And to be able to find a non-invasive way for a client to participate in that process is amazing. We really can extrapolate from orthopedic applications to other inflammation-based conditions. And this extrapolation that I'm talking about, this is supported by literature on the human side uh, for cases of cystitis, pancreatitis, prostatitis, and wound healing. There have been really good studies on the human side about that. And so along those lines, we, in the case of renal disease, we can see a decrease in proteinuria, uh, we can also see reduced pain following breast surgery. It's now in many facilities a sort of de rigueur to, to bandage in a device 
exactly like this into the bandages on the chests of women who have undergone um, uh, mastectomy for breast cancer. We also can find that this has provided decreased prostate volume in a canine model for a benign prostatic hyperplasia, different from prostate cancer in people. And now we also have some really good literature for post-laminectomy patients with intervertebral disc disease that we not only got good pain relief or better pain relief, but we get an enhanced, enhanced effect the longer that they're treated. One of the really cool entries into this market is this concept of whole body treatment. Um, and when we have a cat like this, so um, a she, this is not a picture of my cat, but my cat did benefit from this. Um, Muffin had osteoarthritis in her spine, multiple locations. She had two torn ACLs and her knees were nearly fused from osteoarthritis. She had hip osteoarthritis and she had elbow osteoarthritis. So she was kind of a hot mess. And um, this was a technology that really helped Muffin have a higher quality of life until she died. And when she died, she was 24 years old. This is just an illustration of the calming or anti-seizure application. So one other technology that's a relatively new entry into our world is extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So shockwave therapy isn't super new in and of itself, but now we actually have this modality available to us in a way that is easily in a primary care setting as well as in a specialty setting. So this is a technology that actually uses sound waves uh, that at very high pressure that actually elicit biological changes to the tissue, utilizing these mechanical forces generated by the acoustic sound waves. So it stimulates biological and meta metabolic processes in the tissues. And what's really interesting is that we now know that we get um, increased production of growth factors for both soft tissue and bone. And what that contributes to in the sort of big scheme of things is um, a reduction in substance P. So this alters the pain threshold. But in osteoarthritis, we actually see improved function. So we get reduced lameness, and this actually implies to us that we get reduced pain. Obviously, our patients can't tell us, yes, my stifle feels much better, but the bottom line is we get reduced pain and inflammation, which improves function. And that improved function or decreased lameness has really been demonstrated by force plane analysis. So we get improvement in vertical forces. And there is evidence of this technology helping um, both humans as, and rodents, as well as dogs. So much of the bench science was done in rodents. The, the thing that's different now is that the current presentation of shockwave therapy is very well tolerated by patients who are not sedated. So when this technology was first introduced in veterinary medicine, uh, our standard of care was to either anesthetize or deeply sedate these patients. And what we now have is an application that gives us an opportunity to present this technology to our patients without the need for sedation. In a slick-coated dog like you see here, we can actually use um, our acoustic gel, the, the ultrasound gel, without shaving the patient. Uh, same with this patient getting treatment on the elbow uh, and this patient getting treatment at the shoulder. With animals that have longer hair, we do need to shave so we can get a good interface. Remember, sound waves don't travel through air as well as they travel through a liquid medium. And this is what the unit actually looks like. So what about assistive devices? Well, I will tell you that I think this is one area where veterinary medicine has really fallen behind because we don't have the same imperative to provide or prescribe an assistive device as we do medication, nutrition, nutraceuticals, or physical medicine things like acupuncture, heat therapy, uh, photobiomodulation with laser, uh, shockwave therapy, electropulse, uh, electromagnetic pulse therapy. Assistive devices can be so critical whether we use a wheelchair for walking, 
or we actually have to spend the rear legs, or we even have a neuro patient where we need a four wheel wheelchair. Um, there actually is a um, now a company that is um, creating the opportunity for us to have sort of one stop shopping for uh, assistive devices. And the company that makes a product called UMove Advanced 360, the Lint Bells company, is actually going to be launching uh, um, access to a full spectrum of assistive devices. We also have things like slings. Those are so easy. Supported vests. Um, I really try and be very careful not to brand any of my talks, but I will tell you that my very favorite supportive vest remains the rough wear vest that is uh, really, uh, it's well-made, it's easy to tailor the fit to the patient. We get support from the base of the neck to the, just behind the rib cage. Uh, so the, the rough wear vests are really my favorites. But we also need to remember that we have patients who just can't really walk very far, but they want to be involved and engaged in family activities. And so don't forget to recommend things like rolling carts or wagons. Uh, my own St. Bernard developed degenerative myelopathy and she could not go for walks with the other dogs in my household. We got her a garden wagon that was painted like a John Deere tractor. And I just rolled her along with the other dogs. I got a great workout at the same time. This is Chomo, and I love using Chomo as my example of why I use wheelchairs early. Please notice that Chomo's feet are on the ground. She could still walk. She just was weak from degenerative myelopathy. So when she was 12, we actually fitted her for a wheelchair. And as her DM progressed, then they used slings to put her rear legs up off the floor so that she didn't drag her toenails and wear them out. She went through three sets of wheels on her wheelchair. Within one week of getting her wheelchair, she was back to running three miles a day with her family. And when Shomo died, she was 16 and she died of end-stage renal failure. So she used her wheelchair for four years. So what about modifying the home environment and home activities? Here's another area where I think we as veterinarians and veterinary healthcare professionals can really make a difference. So teach your clients simple things like raising the food and water dishes to the height of the elbow of the patient. I do this for cats. I do this for pugs. I do this for Great Danes. The top of the dishes at elbow height so that the pet does not have to bend over and touch their toes every time they wanna take a drink or eat a meal. Educate your clients about covering slippery floor surfaces and modifying access to stairs. Encouraging them to get a ramp for easy vehicle entry and exit before the dog needs this. Every one of our giant breed dogs, we've had four Great Danes, I've trained them to use a ramp the minute that we've rescued them long before they needed them. And those ramps have been invaluable for allowing the dogs to go for rides, even if it's just down the street to the McDonald's. And helping our clients understand they may have to modify play with other pets. If we have a mixed household where we have an older pet and a younger pet, we may really have to modify, modify how those animals interact. So don't be bashful about that. And don't forget to write everything down for the client. Give that client homework. Uh, one, of the, one of the homeworks that I use are, is therapeutic exercise. And again, the physical therapy and rehab textbooks are great for providing us with access to evidence-based therapeutic exercise. Your clients want to be involved in care, so give them homework. Be as specific as possible and write everything down, not just for yourselves, not just for your teams, but for the client as well. And one of the things I've really encouraged my clients to do is to create a diary of activities of daily living, ADLs. This is something that is actually a very important and very commonly used aspect of physical therapy and rehabilitation therapy in human medicine. When we direct our attention towards pain, it allows us to identify trends. I'm fascinated by how my patient feels today. 
but I'm far more interested in how they are over the span of a week or a month because it's the trends that guide our therapy and allow us to make changes. Now, one last thing before I let you go and answer some questions is what about pain and fear and anxiety and stress? Well, with unacceptable behaviors, things that happen that go badly in the exam room, please always think that patient may be experiencing pain. One of the things that we know, rock solid, solid science, is that anxiety exacerbates pain and pain exacerbates anxiety. So we need to look at the whole patient. We need to ask lots of questions and we need to listen very carefully to our clients for clues that will let us know that a patient is now painful. Um, as a sidebar comment, and again, I try and steer clear of branded messages, but this is a really important addition in our way of communicating with our clients that our patients are painful. So Edis has just launched a client-facing website that educates clients about what it means and how to recognize that their cats are painful. And I would encourage all of you to go to that site and see these animated videos because they are so, so amazing. And such an easy way for us to help our clients understand that we may not be able to see stuff in the exam room that they see at home that can in fact indicate that their cats are experiencing pain and that we should deal with it. Ask for pictures and videos from home. Every one of our clients has a camera in their pocket and this can be, I mean, it is true that a picture is worth a thousand words. Older dogs, older cats, they may be fearful of us because they're painful. So it's really important that we understand and remind ourselves that while animals cannot and do not anticipate or fear their own death, they absolutely anticipate and fear pain. And if handling by humans is painful, that for them is torture. And we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. We have a bioethical obligation to give them the benefit of the doubt. So please keep an open mind about this. We need to take a considered approach when we're handling our patients. We need to engage our patients to actually participate in their own care. And if we forge ahead, it means escalating their fear, anxiety, and stress. And that can in turn, as I just indicated, and as we know from science, exacerbate their pain. So from a bioethical perspective, please treat your patients like you would treat pre-verbal children. It's how they treat pre-verbal children in the human pain arena. We need to identify what we absolutely need versus what we want. And I would just exhort you all that it's time for us all to be fear-free professionals.